Sol qua, ehi, figaro! Sol qua, figaro qua, figaro là, figaro qua, figaro là, figaro su, figaro giù, figaro su, figaro giù. My guest on this occasion is our director for the Barber of Seville, Christopher Matagliano. Uh, I've known you, Chris, for many, many years, and I am just thrilled to be finally able to work with you on a production <laughs> here in Cincinnati. And uh, this production of the Barber of Seville has been around a while. You originated it, so you know it backwards and forwards. But I'm wondering if you'd start by giving us your sort of, I don't know, elevator speech version of the plot of the Barber of Seville, because there will be people coming to it for the first time. Right. And I, uh, well, first of all, good to see you, Evans, and thank you for having me and uh, wonderful to catch up with you. Um, uh, and I always try and remind myself whenever I'm directing any production that there are always people seeing it for the first time. Uh, uh, there are people in that audience that are going to experience this wonderful opera for the first time. And uh, that's um something to keep in mind for all of us that have been around the block a few times in this profession, right? Uh, I said, um, you know, I I mentioned to you that I'm currently directing the production um, elsewhere. Um, and I said to the Figaro who's doing the role for the first time yesterday, I kind of envy you that, you know, I wish I could remember what it was like to experience this opera for the first time, because it is such a joy to revisit. Um, but my, uh, okay, uh, the a one minute uh, synopsis, a plot synopsis. Um, we are in Seville. This production is set in the 1830s. Um, the plot of uh, the Barber of Seville is kind of really based on a classic sort of commedia dell'arte uh, storyline in which we have <clears throat> uh, the young, beautiful Rosina, who is the ward of uh, Bartolo, Dr. Bartolo, a very learned man uh, who's very tied to the former century and has a very old fashioned way of looking at things. Um, so she is she is the ward of this curmudgeon Bartolo. And essentially she outwits him um, and manages to marry her true love who is the Count Almaviva, who is in disguise as a student a poor student, Lindoro. Um, so the the lovers, Rosina and Alma Viva, out with the old curmudgeon Bartolo, all through the help, uh, the machinations of the wily Figaro, who is indeed the barber of Seville. How's that? That's terrific. And <laughs> if, if we, we could give a little background by saying that, of course, this originates at least in the form that uh, Cesare Sterbini and Rossini adapted from a very famous play by Beaumarchais. Yes. Who himself, after um, trying to rise through the political ranks in his uh, native Paris, yeah. had a short posting in Spain where he was trying to get a sort of political job there. Didn't work out, but he got all this wonderful sort of background, real life material to go back and write not one, but two, but three plays based on this Figaro story. This is yes. the this is this is where our young Alma Viva and young Rosina meet. And we will meet them again, of course, uh, in another opera by Mozart, when yeah. they are further grown up and their marriage is not as rosy as it will be at the end of this yes. opera. That's yes. Right. Yes. Um so Chris, if you would then give us character portraits of mm. the individual singers, starting with our two lovers. Yes. Who is Rosina, who is Alma Viva? Right. Well, Alma Viva is a, a wealthy count. Um, you you know, in this uh, in in this opera, certainly when you meet him, you, you one might say, well, he comes across a little bit as a kind of an arrogant, wealthy, you know, health, wealthy teenager uh, who is frustrated that he's not getting his way. Um, and he's fortunate to run into Figaro, who aids him. But he's uh, essentially a a young teenager in love. Um, and as he says, I, you know, I saw this woman at the Prado and um, have been pursuing her, but she's kept under lock and key. So he's, he's a man following his heart. Um, she indeed uh, has the same feeling from him through their meetings and through him serenading her. So we have classic young lovers with both Rosina and Alba Viva. Rosina being a kind of like of an iconic female character in that she really does um, 
uh, follow her star and uh, does all she can to follow her heart. Uh, and is uh, certainly in this production, we try and portray her as strongly as possible. Um, but they, they are the, the quintessential young lovers. Um, Figaro uh, is a man about town who, who gets by, as he says, uh, by his wits. Um, if he's well known. He's uh, you know he's the barber. He's the he's a surgeon. He's uh, the, a matchmaker. He's just one of those guys that manages to, by the sheer power of his personality and his energy, just kind of make ends meet. Um, and he has a zest for life. I mean, his his opening aria, Largo, the famous aria that he enters with, really describes his character. Um, and then we have. Dr. Bartolo, who is someone that is very old fashioned, very uncomfortable with change in the world, sees himself as a very uh, as a very educated and refined gentleman and has no tolerance for the new trends around town in Seville. And unfortunately, he's chosen as a confidant, uh, Basilio, who is, you know, a bit of a shyster that um, you know, makes the rounds, but also manages to sort of uh, uh, endear him to Bartolo and eventually takes advantage of him. Um, so and those, those are the five he's main characters. Nominally a singing teacher, right? I mean, he, he he brands himself as a teacher of singing. He does indeed. He has uh, managed to convince Bartolo that he should be Rosina's music singing teacher, but you get the impression that he's a, a uh, a bit of a charlatan. I may, I don't know. You know, sometimes he's played as a total, uh, you know, a low, low, low character. But um, I kind of see both him and Bartolo as men that see themselves as sophisticated and learned, uh, but are just a little clueless. <laughs> I love, by the way, that you bring up the point that uh, Lindoro has spied Rosina, not at a bullfight and not out on an evening's passeggiata, but mm. at the Prado, at the art museum. Where, yes. So it, it 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 instantly says that both of these characters love culture, um, or they know that like people used to come to the zoo at Cincinnati to see the opera at the zoo because that's where they that's where all they got their first dates. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we have these characters in this wonderful play that originates in the 18th century, um, which then is turned into an opera in the early 19th century, yeah. and I wonder if you put the opera and Rossini sort of in a historical context. Where are we in the journey of mm. the opera as the art form, which starts effectively in 1600 in Italy with Monteverdi and goes yes. to the whole Baroque era, where this is all 2020 hindsight, of course. Yep, yep. Where does where does Rossini fit in the yeah. opera journey that takes us to today? Well, he is of course, the first of the great bel canto composers. So here we are, you know, in, in the beginning of the 19th century in what is often referred to as the golden age of Italian opera. And here we have, you know, the first bel canto composer, uh, you know, of course, the words bel canto, beautiful song, beautiful singing, um, begins with Rossini and then travels forward with Donizetti, my favorite Italian composer, Bellini, and then culminates with Verdi. Um, and Verdi dies in 1901. So here we are. I want to say this opera was composed with 1816, 1818, around there. Um, premieres, yeah, exactly right, in Rome. That's okay. Right. And uh, so we're at the beginning of the golden age of Italian opera. Um, and all that we love about this period is to be found in abundance in the score. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, one... One one could debate for hours what is the greatest operatic tragedy, right? What is the what is the you know the, the that could be any number of operas of uh, but really is there any doubt what is the greatest operatic comedy ever composed? Certainly the most beloved. Absolutely. Yes, and the most beloved. I mean, sure, you could say you know Falstaff might be a close second. Um, I, I find it interesting that uh, the other ones that might come up are also by Rossini, Cenerentola, L'Italiana in Algeri. But uh, uh, there is absolutely no doubt the greatest comic masterpiece is Rossini's The Barber Seville. And uh, for me, it's it's just, it's one of the marvels of the entire operatic canon. And I must say, it's always a joy to revisit 
this piece and spend time with these characters and their splendid music. Um, but here we are. This is Rossini, the beginning, you know, of the of the great century, bel canto century of Italian opera. We see him earlier in his career getting his start in Venice, mm -hmm. writing little one-act comedies, some of which get produced again from time to time. They were, they're called farce that were done yes. for uh, those famous Venetian opera theaters, that one of which had been around since the time of Monteverdi and Cavalli. Um, but he grows in sophistication really quickly and mm. codifies for what is essentially most of the century certain forms, certain yes. procedures that, it's not a formula, but they're guidelines on how to make a strongly knit together work. And I'm wondering if you'd spend a moment talking about uh, structure and how Rossini transcends his own rules. What does he mm -hmm. do to make it not only fit within the conventions of his time, but break those conventions as well? Sure. Uh, well, um, I think the key musical element that musicologists, uh, you know, and, and music lovers uh, associate with Rossini, which really took Europe by storm in the early 19th century, is the Rossini crescendo. So th that that is, everyone was just, I mean, it's hard for us to, you know, here we are 200 years later, right? Uh, it's hard for us to, to fully appreciate what, the Rossini, the Rossini crescendo, the effect that had on European audiences. You know, there's a wonderful book uh, I read years ago called Romantic Affinities, and I forget the name of the author, but a really wonderful book about the 19th century. And there's an entire chapter on the Rossini crescendo and how Europeans were obsessed with it, and they couldn't wait for the next Rossini opera to experience what he does in creating a crescendo in his operas. Um, and there are, you know, two or three great examples of that in the Barber Seville. Um, starting with the overture, of course, right? Yes, starting with the overture. Uh, the act one finale, um, you know, just builds and builds and builds and builds in excitement that is so unique to Rossini. Um, uh, you know, I would say also his ability, which is a unique part of his genius, um, to create mayhem through sound, to, to create to create dramatic and emotional mayhem through musical means, it is such a unique part of his genius, and there's no better example of it than the Act One finale of the Barber of Seville, which is just it's it's an entire opera unto itself practically. Uh, and he and, always seems to find time to drop out the orchestra and yes. have all of the singers so many directors just have them absolutely freeze yes and totally a cappella. yes uh, what do you normally do in a situation like that do you actually most of the time freeze the characters so that it, the music comes through like that or do you keep them moving how do you how do you deal with that wonderful moment when there's no orchestra yeah um Gosh, that's an excellent question. I mean, it in in this production, it's it's quite physical, it's quite detailed, and it's quite disciplined. I will say, um, and I think it's partly why it continues to be a very successful production. Um, in that, I want very much the production to 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 reflect the energy and the detail of the music, but how that gets physicalized on stage is really case by case, depending on what musical section we're talking about and the singers I'm working with, and to a certain extent, the conductor and his or her choice of tempi. Um, so I always tend to leave things open until I'm actually in the room with the singers, knowing what I did before, but I try and forget what I did before. Uh, sure, and there are, in this production, um, there are occasional tableaus that freeze with, with the music. Um, and then unfreeze at a certain point. Um, there are certain bits that are purely choreographed. Um, so I, I, the staging is quite larger than life at times, in the best sense of the word. And and but very detailed. You know, uh, I think it was Stephen Sondheim that said, "God is in the details." Um, and so I always try and work in a very detailed manner with the singers, but but have it relate very specifically to what the orchestra. Or the vocal on is telling us. I don't know if I've answered your question, Evans. You have beautifully. Okay, good. <laughs> you know that this opera is filled with hit tunes. Um, yes. With uh, the Largo al Factotum and uh, Rosina's entrance aria, yes. you know, 
Ogufa, Lindoro's entrance area, Eco di Dente in Cielo. Right. So, uh, a question I have asked all of our directors, and um, this is almost a moot point with you, but I would imagine you would concur with me that there's al almost every tune in the opera is a wonderful tune for a first timer because he's just so, Rossini's gift for melody is so extraordinary. Yes, yes. If you had to pick a favorite of the of the main arias, do you have a favorite one as a director? And yeah. As much as a music lover. Boy. I know it's like asking you to pick your favorite child, which is a Yeah, favorite. yeah. I mean, I I uh I'm as I said earlier, it's it's always I've been directing this I created this production in the mid 1990s for the Minnesota Opera and I've directed many revivals of it and each one has always been somewhat different depending on the artists I'm working with in the company. Um, but it is always a joy to be back in the room and hearing these melodies. And I continue to be astounded by the sheer inventiveness of the music. I would say for me, I mean, the arias you mentioned, sure, uh, Figaro's famous entrance aria, Largo and Rosina's Una Voce Poco Fa are iconic pieces within the art form. Uh, but I must say the the ensembles continue to astound me how inventive and energetic they are. The the, the quintet in the middle of Act Two, uh, the Buonasera quintet, um, the Act One finale, as I mentioned earlier, is sublime. There is something incredibly irresistible uh, about that I find about the music, uh, the duet between Figaro and and Rosina, the um, Dunque Io Son. Um, uh, and I must say, this I, I'm glad you mentioned this as a, a good opera for pe perhaps people that are trying out opera. It's an excellent first opera, um, uh, and it's a feast. It's a, it's an embarrassment of riches in terms of the sheer number of great melodies in it, um, and it flies by. Uh, it's so well paced, and I must you know, with all due respect, this production is very well paced in terms of how how it's staged because the production is designed in a way that you never wait for a set change. Um, um, th that was a very specific goal when I created the production with Alan Moyer, uh, the set designer, that we we wanted, because the opera can stop and start quite a bit between number, recit, you know, ensemble, recit, we designed it specifically to always keep moving. Uh, so the conductor never has to wait to start the next piece. You indicate something here that I think is worth dwelling on for just a moment. In Rossini's ability to take an ensemble number with multiple voices singing and not necessarily stop the action they are mm -hmm. they are they drive the plot forward not on like let's say the great last 25 minutes of the second act of the marriage of figaro mm -hmm. even mozart himself writes in a letter to his father he just it blows his own mind away that a duet becomes a trio becomes a quartet becomes a yep. quartet and so but rossini does this regularly where he uses the forces not just to reflect but to push the story forward. Yes, yes. So much fun. Yes. You know, all four of our operas this summer, I could say probably the majority of operas, certainly of the 19th century, um, uh, engage in one way or the other how women are portrayed in drama. Mm. And uh, this is one of the rare times uh, where women do get the upper hand. So often yes. they are ones. Um, they are the source of the, the, the tragic uh, dynamic of a piece. But this one is a little bit different in that uh, the girl gets her guy and all is well in the end. But tell me, in your in your long association with the piece and with this production, mm. uh, do you portray Rosina differently with different singers? How do, how is she shaped mm. from time to time as you re-engage with this production? Well, um, uh I try to find, uh, it, certainly with the character of Rosina, I try to find the strength in her character wherever there's an opportunity to do so. Um, she makes it very clear to the audience in her entrance aria that she's capable of, of playing the role of being the obedient ward uh, and the obedient sort of, you know, young lady, um, but that she is not to be messed with, and that I and that I and I am determined to get my way, which she does. So on on one hand, I guess she's kind of unique in terms of nineteenth century op operatic characters, female characters. Um, but uh, you know, I I I mean, I guess in the larger question uh, about 
because I, I was looking at your season. So you're doing Lucia, you're doing Butterfly. Right. And the knot uh, and you, is about and you're doing a new piece. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I guess on one hand, you can say old European composers or, 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 or librettists of the time, you know, didn't see women or female characters the way we do. And thank God the, the, that the world has changed since then. Um, but I think all of us as producers are struggling with how do we tell these stories today? How do we tell? You know, um, or should we be telling these stories today where where women are portrayed in a way that's becoming less and less acceptable to, to well, just the world in to, which we live? Yeah, to experience in the theater. Yeah. Um, you know, how does it serve us to keep telling these stories? I, I, I don't know if we want to, you know, if I'm getting off track here, but but not I at but, not at all yeah. because it's a topic that we are engaging with throughout the season because, as you rightly point out, most of the women in opera are victims. Gia yep. uh, is is basically sold into marital slavery mm -hmm. as this butterfly, and yes. the women in the knock are these military wives. Uh, one of the undercurrents that our librettist discovered as she was writing the story is that military wives, when their husbands are deployed overseas, um, are kept under very close scrutiny if they live on mm. base. Mm -hmm. Their behavior can affect their husband's progress through promotion in the military. So even today, um, within the context of certain situations, um, women are women are, as it were, made responsible for the actions of men. Mm -hmm. And um, this is, uh, I think, one of the reasons I'm excited about this season is because we are engaging with this with this dilemma that we find mm -hmm. ourselves and hoping to use it in the largest sense of the word as a teaching moment uh, as we hopefully grow as a society. Mm -hmm. so, so you're right on the money, uh, Chris. Okay. So as we come to the end of our time together, one of the things that I love about this production is that it is both cartoonish and real at the same time hmm. and you indicated at the beginning of our conversation that you have you you and alan moyer uh, sort of said it a little bit after the time in which it was composed you're sort of yes you know, the first half of the 19th century yes. for a story that effectively took place sometime in the 18th century only because beaumarchais wrote it in the 18th century yes but so what was your reasoning for where you placed it and uh, hmm. Give us a couple of the larger thoughts as to how this, what is the shape and the yeah. uh, intention behind this particular production of the marriage of uh, the marriage of Figaro? Sorry, yeah. it's the next one. The yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, we meet these characters when they're when they're in love and happy, and then yes, as you mentioned earlier, by the time we see them again in the marriage Figaro, they're not so. You know, um, of course, Mozart in his his understanding of the human heart, they become far more complex and 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 troubled um but certainly in this piece they're uh all is well with the world uh provided that figaro can can kind of you know uh, work things out for us when alan and i uh won the full set designer alan moyer and i created this production for the minnesota opera in the mid-1990s um we wanted well first and foremost we wanted to reflect the energy of the music we wanted the production to reflect the the, the character energy of the music um, and yes, we chose to set it during Rossini's time, so it takes place around 1825, 1830, let's say. Um, we, it's, it's funny, we spent, we, we spent a lot of time looking at the caricatures of the time. There's a wonderful book by William Weaver called, uh, uh, the, I think it's called The Golden Age of Italian Opera, then, you know, it's about the 19th century. Um, and that book is full of wonderful illustrations and caricatures of conductors, of singers, of theaters. Um, and that book ended up being a real inspiration for both of us and that we wanted to kind of capture the kind of larger than life grandeur of the period in a kind of nostalgic and affectionate way, not, a, not in a, not in a critical way, but in an, in a way that would embrace the kind of world of Italian opera at the beginning of the century. And those wonderful caricatures of larger than life opera singers that come down stage to the footlights and sing. Um, and so uh, Alan created what is, uh, you know, as your as your audiences will will see, we this production is essentially a theater within a theater. Um, 
So the the set is an enormous golden proscenium, um, and um, we have this proscenium. There are ever present red and gold curtains. There are chandeliers, chandeliers that are present all night, whether we're inside or outside. Um, <laughs> there are footlights. And for observant uh, uh, audience members, they'll notice in Alan's design for the for the um, false proscenium, there are one-dimensional uh, cutouts characters of audience members in their opera boxes. So we wanted the audience to really know. It was okay for us for the audience to know they were at the opera. We kind of wanted to embrace the opera, all of its conventions, all of its cliches and and really hug them and above it all there is this enormous portrait of rossini that that in this production rossini is kind of the fairy godfather uh guiding the fate of the two lovers um and so this is a very nostalgic look back at that period um that uh that i'm just very proud of and i love revisiting we we also made the very conscious effort to make this production very colorful. We want it to be very bold with the colors. So the costumes are quite brilliant and very bold in color. And we wanted to embrace a kind of look of those wonderful one-dimensional drops you see in, in books about Verdi and Donuts at the Imbellini, where you see production photos or production etchings, you know. Um, so this was us in a very loving and nostalgic way looking at those elements uh, of opera in the you know at the beginning of the 19th century and embracing them and finding a kind of fun and unique and energetic way to put them on the stage here in the 20th century. Well, Chris, Does that makes sense. Makes perfect sense, and I'm just <laughs> to spend a little bit of time in the middle of a rehearsal period for the Barber of Seville just before you come to Cincinnati. And yes. by, for those of you who are intrigued by Chris's uh, mention of a book called Romantic Affinities. If you want to find it on Amazon, it's actually Romantic Affinities, written by Rupert Christensen, who is a uh -huh. very celebrated English critic as well as author. Yes. I'm, I know that once we're done talking today, I'm going to go buy it. <laughs> yes, I, I, I love the book. I mean, I read it years ago, but I do remember there is a whole section on the Rossini, uh, on the Rossini crescendo and how it took Europe by storm at the time. Uh, and there's no better example of it than the Barber Seville. Well, Chris, thank you for your time, and we look forward to working with you here in Cincinnati. Thank you so much, Evans. I can't wait to get there.